Listener emails, images, observations, and New Year's wishes on episode 292 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris, and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up the night sky and asking, what would you like to see in 2023? First, uh, we have a, a thank you for a new Patreon supporter, Shane. Yeah, big thanks to Robert. Um, he uh, he recently... Uh, I guess started supporting us on, on Patreon. Although I, I think he might've in the past too. I can't remember, but regardless, um, thanks Robert. And thanks to all of our Patreon supporters. We certainly appreciate it. And, uh, he's associated with analog sky. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Chris? Yeah, I was going back and forth with Robert a bit because, uh, and yeah, the, the name analog sky was familiar to me, but, but I don't know. I, I spent a lot of time looking at binoculars and, and maybe that's just how it crossed my, my mind before. But, uh, but like you said, um, you know, I, I think uh, we've chatted with him before, but analog sky makes these 3d printed binoculars and he's just kind of getting, um, uh, this up and running or he started getting up and running right around the pandemic. But I think originally they were going to go for a, a really big set, but these are, um, sort of uh, like 50 and 80 millimeter binocular patterns and that that you download and then you can uh, get printed. Um, I don't want to give too much of it away because I think he's going to launch in, in March or something like that. But people can go and check out what uh, what they've got on the go so far at analogsky.co. And uh, yeah, I thought they were pretty cool. Um, kind of reminded me in a way of those uh, binoculars that Glenn LeDru, um had made up and written a Sky and Telescope article about. Oh, man. It was, uh, do I still have it open here? It was a long time ago. No, I don't still have it open. But um, anyway, what what essentially you do is you buy a couple sets of uh, of lenses off the uh, off eBay or, or whatever, and then you, you install those with some uh, diagonal mirrors and uh, the rest you get 3D printed at a 3D print shop. And then, uh, yeah, you can basically put in any eyepieces you want. So I was like looking and checking out like, ooh, maybe I'll buy another 22 millimeter Nagler and and get a pair of these uh, set up at some point. And I'd have uh, just about a 10 degree field of view in a, in a 50 millimeter binocular. So uh, so anyway, um, I, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, Shane, but I, I think I included you in some of these because I was just like, super interested in uh in his project there and um uh, he's uh he's in the same telescope making group as tom Otbus, who we interviewed back in early, mm -hmm. early november um but anyway um i did ask robert if he'd be interested in coming on the show when he launches the product mm -hmm. and uh because he's all about the visual side of things um but sort of putting a a modern uh take on it using 3d printing technology to make binoculars which you and i have done before so this is right up our alley yeah yeah when uh when, when uh the correspondence was happening and and he mentioned these binoculars i was very intrigued it's super cool um the uh he's got a, a twitter and a facebook and everything supporting um i guess this venture and there's a lot of photos of the pieces and everything involved it's uh it looks like quite the project i'm i'm super curious to see what this turns into yeah i'm really curious to see as well um yeah that's right up my alley uh like i was telling you before i'm i'm saving up for something else right now i'm, I'm having trouble sort of you know it, it seems like when i'm not saving up for anything <laughs> when the money's already spoken for um yeah nothing's coming up but now that i'm saving up for something uh listeners keep sending me ideas like i had like four people send me stuff this week i'm like oh i want to buy that i want oh that's a cool little telescope oh these are amazing 3d printing binoculars and there was something else oh trip to australia somebody sent it wasn't and then i looked at them like oh well it's going to be super expensive and i found like a flight sale i almost went to australia for march because i found like this super great deal on a flight to australia from here and it was cheaper than my trip back across canada here a few weeks ago so but anyway i'm really having trouble resisting the evil powers that be so <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the desire to uh, do more observing with different equipment or in different locations. Yeah. So we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of listener emails there, Shane. Um, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy getting the listener emails. Uh, no, yep. I'm sure about you? Yeah, we we've had quite a few over the past few weeks. Eh? Yeah, yeah. It just never stops, which is great. I love it. And um, 
kind of say this podcast is is made possible with the listeners because when we started, we didn't intend to have as many episodes. We just uh, we just wouldn't we wouldn't have enough of our own observations or topics to uh, to go through on a on a two a week basis. I, I that I don't think I would be able to do that. I don't know about you. Well, particularly this time of the year, Chris, like we just don't have great conditions to observe, you know, like again, this past week, I don't know if we had a clear night. Um, and if we did, it might've been a, a very small window to observe when I was probably sleeping. So, yeah. um, it's hard, it's hard to talk about astronomy observations when it's cloudy, just about all winter here. <laughs> so, so it's nice to have, uh, you know, these emails to not just discuss, but to sort of live vicariously through. Um, I really enjoy it. Yeah, it's neat. And then uh, people were sending in some questions, um, you know, comments, uh, sending in images. And, uh, you know, we also uh, appreciate the listener support through uh, Patreon, other donations. So thank everybody. So uh, yeah, let's get going. Maybe I'll just uh, read this, this intro and, uh, or do you want to maybe... Do you have the notes open? Can you read the intro? Yeah. And then I'll, I guess this was an email to me. So we'll go, go for it. All right. So I uh, had this nice email from Jim over the holidays uh, with holiday wishes and um, great uh, hour long or hours long exposure of Barnard's loop and the Orion and molecular cloud and brought out some really nice features like M78 and the horse head nebula. One of the things I really liked about, uh, about Jim's image was right below, uh, on the limb, which is the middle star in, in Orion's belt, which coincidentally, unplanned, we talked about in uh, in a podcast we recorded yesterday with Dave Chapman, which will come out uh, a week from the day this one drops. So, come yes, on. episode two ninety four, episode two ninety four, exactly. And in this image, you can see this gap right below that middle star in Orion's belt, which was something I talked about in my wide field wonders list in the observer's handbook and. It's one of the most um, frequently asked questions I get about that list because a lot of people often say, like, that, that's not a visible thing, or I tried to take a photo of it, and I couldn't even get it on a photo, so how could you see it? But uh, his image captures it, it perfectly, whereas you have um, the large nebulae from, you know, that uh, IC434 and um, M the uh, Horsehead Nebula region uh, extending to almost that middle star in Orion's belt. And then there's kind of like a break or a gap, and then it kind of starts up again. And that is something that uh, you can see visually. It is it is very difficult to see, but uh, you can see it in binoculars. I've seen it in my 7x35s, and I think I saw it in your 12x36s when we were in the winter, I think when you first got them. And anyway, uh, it is something that is, that is visible. Pretty cool. Anyway, uh, Jim goes on to write, uh, I hope you got home safely and uh, celebrated a great new year. A couple of months ago, we exchanged emails about your observations in Orion and mentioned my hope to capture a wide field image of Barnard's loop. I managed to capture a couple of hours of data last night on a four panel mosaic with my 40 millimeter refractor, which has 180 millimeter focal length. I think it's one of those Ascar ones, isn't it? Uh, could be. I'm not sure. I think those are the ones people seem to be using. I'm hoping to add more exposures with the clouds dis, um, when the clouds dissipate in a couple of weeks. While well, I'm happy with the start, Orion rules the night sky for me this time of year. Hope for clear skies and minor attempts to you, Jim. So that was a pretty nice one. A pretty nice uh, image there. And I think he updated me with uh, additional images and that sort of thing. It was uh, pretty cool. But I, I just really liked that that image you sent because uh really shows barnard's loop really well like the brighter portions and the thing that i noticed with uh with his image is that uh the stuff that you can see in the image is is the stuff that seems to pop out for me when i'm using like an h beta filter so uh pretty nice uh, pretty nice image there yeah the other thing i like about it like you see barnard's loop uh m42 the belt of orion all of this is in one image like it's a it's a very wide field um 
And when you see the horse head, <laughs> uh, it just gives you a real good uh, scale of how, how, I guess, how small the horse head really is. And mm. and like oftentimes when you see images of the horse head, it's really just the horse head in the image. And, you know, it looks like this uh, incredible object um, and it is quite neat. It's just, I think the scale is often lost in most photographs. And when you see it in such a wide field here and it's like this little black dot, essentially, yeah. it, uh, it really, you know, Know, adds that context of, of what you might be looking for if you're trying to observe the horse head. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, like my any observations I've made of the horse head, like through my small telescopes, have kind of mimicked what what is shown in this image. So, mm -hmm. yeah, pretty good. Just sort of a little notch in the nebula, just the, the visible nebula. Yeah, just a little notch in in that nebulosity there. Even when I'm zoomed in, but I think his image there is about. I think it's just about. I think it's 10 degrees high by like eight degrees wide or something like that. So it's well representative of, of uh, my observations with the uh, Borg uh, 50 F5 that you made me up and that I use with my two inch uh, Massey MI piece. So very nice. Yeah, right on. And then Peter sent us a, a pretty cool image of M33 yeah. and uh, maybe I'll just read that one. So Peter says, hi, Chris and Shane, happy new year. And also best wishes for great observing. Enjoyed the holiday period shows very much. Brian Ventrudo is a special guy. Uh, the nights here are blanketed in clouds for the moment. So not much going on. Uh, I've attached a recent image of M33 from early December. It was taken with a new uh, ASI, I think, uh, 533 MC Pro with a square sensor through the Takahashi FC100DZ with a 0 0.66 reducer and an Optolong L-Pro filter. Uh, it's a stack of 30 by 2 minute exposures. There's minimal processing of the image. I don't really know how uh, yet. Uh, the TAC optics are really something, uh, with no distortion of the stars right to the edge of the field. Uh, hope to catch this at the eyepiece under uh, dark sky sometime. All the best from Peter. Yep. And yeah, that that image is uh, quite nice, you know, and and it it sort of reminds me of just the visual views I would have of M thirty three through my twelve inch. Um, now. The image, especially the core of the galaxy uh, here is, is brighter than what I saw through my 12 inch, but in this image, the arm, so M33 is basically a, a face on spiral galaxy and through my 12 inch, I could like kind of faintly discern a couple of those spiral arms. And in this image, you can faintly discern some of those spiral arms too. And, and, uh, it just, to me, it really represents, uh, what the visual view was like of this, uh, many years ago for me. Yeah. It kind of looks like, um, sort of like wispy clouds, cumulus clouds that have been stirred up into, uh, into like a vortex or a spiral pattern. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I like it. So Wade from Australia, uh, he had some, um, feedback. I think he was the one that sent us the link to the, uh, I think it's called OzFest or something like that. Anyway, the, the star party down, down there. Anyway, Wade goes on to say, Hey guys, just catching up on the podcast. I heard you talk about wide field eyepieces in episode 285. I thought I would put forward an argument for the 35 millimeter pan. He oh, said, yes. screaming at my phone, but you couldn't hear me. <laughs> it's funny. He's not the only one that said that sort of comment in the past. Um, I know Dave, Dave Chapman in the past tonight will write me an email or I'll call him and we'll be talking. He goes, Oh, I was listening to your podcast the other day. And I was like screaming back at my earbuds or whatever, but you know, that's great. Yeah. If you guys ever think of something that uh, you feel passionate about, yeah, drop us a line. It's great. He said, this is not as wide as the 41 pan or the 31 Nagler, but the uh, 35 millimeter pan optic is lighter and smaller than both of them. 200 grams less, same way as the 22 Nagler, but a wider true field of view, bigger exit pupil, but less apparent field of view. Wider tr true field of view than a 30 millimeter um, ultra flat field, but a little heavier, 200 grams more. Works perfectly with F5 scopes, giving a seven millimeter exit pupil and tons of eye relief. Actually too much for me, but Teleview sells an, an eye cup extender, which works perfectly, just my two cents, clear skies. Wade, what are your, what are your thoughts on the 35 millimeter pan chain? Uh, I love that eyepiece. Um, that was my first 
I'm trying to think that was my first two inch eyepiece that I had bought. Um, and prior to that, I just, I was strictly inch and a quarter mm -hmm. and I had a 24 millimeter pan optic, which I really enjoyed using in my eight inch, uh, Dobsonian as well as my 12 inch. Um, but you know, as I read more and more stuff in magazines and astronomy books, people talked about the advantages of a wide field eyepiece and helping you locate objects. Um, so you know, my scopes then, well, the, uh, the light bridge that I had was an F5. So, um, you know, 35 millimeter eyepiece was kind of like the, the ideal size, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, exit pupil that I would want. So that's, that's what I bought was the, the 35 millimeter pan optic and it blew me away. Um, like I was really astonished by how big of a field view I had and how it did actually help me to find objects. It was, it was quite nice. Um, and I used the, I used that eyepiece like crazy. It, it lived in the telescope an awful lot. And similar to Wade, I had to also, um, buy an eye cup extender, um, without the eye cup extender, like the eye relief is so large that I found like you had to just have perfect eye placement or else I would experience blackouts. Um, but the eye cup extender really solved that. So, um, I highly recommend that. Um, but anyway, I kept that eyepiece for a long time. And then I got into the world of refractors and I ended up with a, a 41 millimeter pan optic because I wanted the widest field of view I could possibly get. Mm -hmm. um, and then not long after that, I purchased uh, the, the Teleview Genesis SDF telescope, which is the predecessor to the NP101. And really like the 31 Nagler and the NP101, like those both of those instruments or, or, you know, uh, you know, the eyepiece and telescope are almost designed to work together. Like it's just the match, like the perfect match. So when I got the, the Genesis SDF, I thought I should probably get the 31 Nagler because of this, you know, special match that they seem to have there. And between the 31, uh, Nagler, the 35 pan and the 41 pan, the 35 sort of became, I don't know, a little redundant. Like I just wasn't using it. It was either the 41 pan or the 31 Nagler. So I ended up selling the 35 pan and, uh, there's times I do regret it just because it is so much lighter than both, uh, the 31 Nagler and the 41, uh, pan optics. So, um, it's a great eyepiece. Uh, Wade is right. And you know, if, if people had that as piece, they certainly would not regret it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I like the 35 millimeter pan like you, I didn't buy it. But I had it on loan. Um, another observer in the astronomy club I belonged to at the time uh, had one and uh, loaned it out to me for like a few weeks or a month or something like that. And I used it a ton. And uh, But I did find the weight a, a little bit much on my my smaller refractors. So, um, you know, I, I didn't end up uh, buying one. But I, I, you know, am very familiar with it, having used it plenty. And uh, yeah, just a phenomenal uh, wide field eyepiece. Um, and like, like he was saying it, you know, as far as those bigger, heavier two inch eyepieces go, it's, uh, it's not at the top end of the big and heavy eyepieces. So it's certainly big and heavy. Um, but it's sort of in that same range as like the 40 millimeter, um, Pentax XW, which is what I ended up getting instead of the 35 pan. Cause like you, Shane, I wanted to have an eyepiece that would work um, in my refractors, which are a little bit longer and you can get just a slightly wider, uh, field of view there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. So we have, uh, we had some holiday wishes from Mark Radici of the refreshing views, uh, YouTube channel. So always nice to hear from Mark. He's been a guest on the show, uh, a couple times anyway, if people are interested, they should check out, um, Mark's refreshing views. Uh, YouTube channel. He does lots of uh, interesting, mostly visual, a little bit of astrophotography stuff on there through his uh, his Refreshing Views Observatory. But uh, maybe I'll let you take this email away, Shane. Sure. Um, uh, Mark says, hi, Chris and Shane. I hope this email finds you well. How is the weather in your part of the world? Um, well, not very good. <laughs> uh, we have been hearing about the terrible winter storms, so I hope this finds you and your family safe. I imagine your observing opportunities are limited for the time being. Uh, I am writing this as I listen to the Radcliffe Wave episode. Fascinating stuff. 
Uh, I am in the observatory under a clear, calm sky, uh, and then in brackets, before the next rain front moves in. It is simply wonderful to listen to this while I watch Mars on my laptop screen uh, before I go uh, and track Comet C2020 V2 uh, ZTF as it, pass, as it tracks past Polaris. Uh, in the meantime, I hope Father Christmas was kind and left a high-end apo for you both with top-notch eyepieces. I clearly have not been very good as my C14 edge did not arrive. Uh, stay safe and speak soon. Best regards, Mark Radici. Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. Really appreciate it. Like, I really hope he gets the C14 edge. You know, I really like his setup. It's funny um, because before he was on the show, I was familiar with his channel. And then I think you had some sort of correspondence with him. He came on the show and so many times, like I'm looking at stuff and his channel pops up because um, I think we have a very similar way of observing or something and, and, or the way that we like to have our gear set up. Like he sort of is um like about a year or two ahead of me so i've been looking and he set up one of those um az gt sixes and uh he put his 90 millimeter refractor on one side i think it's a william optics or similar and then he's got his c11 on the other side and i i really think that's the setup i want i want to put my 125 sd on one side and then you know i was thinking about getting like a different scope or something like that but I think getting like an 11 inch Schmidt Cassegrain for the other side might be, uh, might be a neat option. So I get sort of the wide field, uh, five inch, uh, you know, apocromat that can do planetary and wide field observing. And then an 11 inch on the other side, people should write, let me know. Is, would that be a good setup for me? I'd be curious to hear what people think. Well, I'll tell you what I think, Chris, there's an opportunity <laughs> for you well, right now. I think you're out to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, another amateur astronomer in Canada, uh, lives in, uh, the neighboring province to us. Uh, his name's Tyson, Tyson M. Oh on yeah, Cloudy I saw Nights. that. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Tyson has some amazing, uh, telescopes and, um, he's selling some because I think he's trying to buy a 200, uh, an eight inch tech, uh, Apple, um, but he sold his 25 inch daub, uh, which would have been amazing. Oh, I know he sold that already. Yeah. It sold real quick. Um, but he has a nine inch I star refractor oh, I for $5,500, which is like, like it's a significant amount of money, but, uh, for what that telescope is probably worth, I think that that's a steal of a deal. So I think you should buy the nine inch. And, uh, I know that that is sort of out of, uh, out of phase with your current plan, but you know, these opportunities don't come up too often. So. I, I looked at that. I did. No, yep. no joke. I did look at it and, and had pause. <laughs> and yes. because, yeah, I've often thought that would be, that would be a telescope I'd want to have. I guess my concerns with a nine inch refractor are that it is, um, that is like definitely needs a permanent home. Yes. And the problem is I'd be I'd be choosing between having a permanent home for my telescopes and owning a telescope that needed a permanent home. So it's a bit of a catch 22 with that instrument for me. Um, at this time anyway, I think mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, I would struggle to, um, uh, to ever get an observatory if I, if I spent all the money on the, uh, on the refractor. Cause I think that's about my observatory budget. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I very loosely considered it. Um, but I don't have a mount that could handle that. And, um, you know, I think the mount would probably be about another $3,000, which again, you know, the, the telescope though, I, I think it's probably worth at least twice what he's asking. So oh, I think so. Yeah. I think it's a good deal. I, I really, I really had hoped that maybe he would, he would sell it eventually. So I was actually more disappointed in anything that he put up for sale. I figured that he probably would sell it eventually, but I kind of had hoped that maybe, uh, it might be too, if it was two years down the road or three years down the road, three years down the road, for sure. I, I probably would have been, you know, uh, jumping on it cause I could have bought it. I could have stored it for another year while I saved up for a proper amount for it. And then, you know, I am building, uh, hoping to build an observatory and, and if, if I get one built, it's going to you know, be built to a size that, that would be able to accommodate uh, that telescope if I ever go for it, because I think that would be, you know, the upper limits, but still at the same time, you know, I would like to have my five inch refractor always ready to go. And I'd like to be able to have the option of switching out the five for the four, or any of the other scopes I have. And then as well, uh, 
still wouldn't have the resolution that like an 11 inch McCasser grain has. And then the other concern I have with such a huge scope is like the difference between, um, you know, looking sort of towards the horizon and looking up overhead, like that eyepiece is going to swing through a huge range where, you know, you're probably going to need to step on a little step ladder to, uh, to look through the eyepiece when it's pointed anywhere near the horizon. And then you're going to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, laying down on the floor and looking straight ahead to look at anything towards the Zenith. So, uh, yeah, there's some challenges there with that scope. I think, I, I don't know. I, I would need some more time to think about it. Like there's a lot of practical implications for, for that, but, uh, yeah, well, it definitely changes your observatory design probably just to house something that large. Cause the tube would be enormous. Um, and then probably to, to, um, sort of help out with that awkward eyepiece height. I think you would almost need a, like a pier that has the adjust, like a, an electronic motor that adjusts yeah. height. Um, so it can kind of come up and down based on where that eyepiece is. Yeah. So it, it just adds a whole nother layer of planning and complexity and, and needed gear, uh, to the whole setup. But, you know, Tyson used this as not well, sort of jokingly tongue in cheek here uh, as a grab and go telescope, <laughs> like he did not have a permanent home for it. He had a, like an automotive engine lift that he would put the telescope into the, the, this lift, uh, to, like kind of use the hydraulics in it to hoist it up high enough that he could then attach it to an alt as mount, uh, an APM I think it's called like a max load or something yep. like that. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Yeah. It's like a T mount and uh, away he'd go, which, um, you know, good on him <laughs> to come up with a solution to, um, you know, making this telescope usable without having to have like two or three people, you know, around to, to mount it and take it down. But, yeah. but, uh, ideally, uh, I think you'd want that in a permanent observatory. Oh, oh, for sure. Like for sure. Like a hundred percent, that would just be you know, crazy to try to have as, as anything, but, but, you know, I was looking cause, cause, uh, again, like some months ago, there was, um, you know, good, good, big refractors do come up from time to time for good pricing. There was a mead seven inch, um, mm -hmm. poker mat that came up that I hemmed and hawed over too. Yeah. I remember that. And so that also is, uh, like it's 180 millimeter scope by F9. Anyway, it comes out to about approximately the same focal length as the um, as the nine inch f seven seven. So, they I, I looked at somebody who had one, and they had the um, the mead in a ten by ten observatory. So it is possible to uh, to get you know, and it worked well. They said it worked well. There was two people; it was a husband and wife duo, and that's what they were using. I think it's like in Mississauga or somewhere. Anyway, I, I think it's in Canada. Anyway, they, they had built a 10 by 10 observatory for it to meet those kind of requirements. And, uh, yeah, they weren't having any, any trouble with it in, um, in that kind of observatory. So, you know, I think if I go for 10 by 10, I think, I think I'll be, I'll be okay. Maybe <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. And if anybody is interested in a nine inch refractor and you live in Canada, it is on astrobicell.com. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If somebody wants to take ownership of it for four or five years while I get myself straightened out, then, uh. <laughs> yeah, then we can maybe do doing it, or or I can house it for somebody. I mean, if you want to buy it, Shane, I can give it a good home. <laughs> well, you know, I would almost want to buy it just to take it down to grasslands once or twice and see how that thing performs under a, um, an almost perfect sky, because <laughs> yeah. I think that would be absolutely incredible. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, and the other thing I was thinking, you know, that because uh, I I just don't think I can swing it. I mean, I could, like I said, I could buy that telescope and not build an observatory, or I can build an observatory because I think an observatory is going to run about what that scope uh, mount it would would run, mm -hmm. and maybe not even that much. So, and I still don't have all the money for that. So anyway, um, but is the uh, there is always the option of of maybe going with the eight inch f six at some point in time. Yeah, exactly. There's always options and there will always be other big telescopes for sale. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's surprising. Like, uh, you know, the things that I've seen come through in, in the past year have been, uh, uh, well, this at uh, nine inch F seven, seven, I've seen one or two eight inch F six, um, I saw seven F seven and I saw the mead, uh, seven inch F nine. Um, you know, and it's kind of like in a way for all those scopes, 
pluses and minus. They're all sort of six and one half a dozen to the other. They're all massive, big, uh, sort of at the the top end of uh, the largest amateur refractors that that one can sort of reasonably get. So mm-hmm. a- anyway, anyway, maybe we'll move on to uh, Chris from Long, Long Island. Yeah, yeah. Let's so do that. yeah, I'll take a read of this. Um, yeah, I've chatted with Chris a uh, fair bit in the past. We've chatted with Chris a fair bit in the past, and he writes, uh, "Dear Chris and Shane, or Shane and and Chris." Uh, that's what he wrote. I wanted to take a moment to wish you both Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Haven't emailed in a while, but have been listening twice a week, nonstop. Still a great podcast. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your support. We appreciate it. This fall, I changed my IP strategy. I have a grab and go rig that I keep set up and near the door. What a great idea. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> An AT60ED on a DSV-M, which is the Desert Sky I don't know what the V-M stands for, though. And a carbon fiber tripod. More importantly, I keep three plossel, a, a three plossel set with it. Teleview 32, 15, and 8. I also have a Teleview 2.5X Paramate. That's a, what a great setup. It's perfect, really. It covers everything. Covers everything. And I just, I think that uh, the good portable 60 millimeter scopes like I I can't believe how much I I use my my Takahashi FS60. Um, I remember when I bought that, I really thought I was making a huge mistake to uh, to spend so much money on a sm- on the smallest portable telescope. But that telescope gets absolutely used uh, twice as much as anything else. And there's so many nights where I otherwise wouldn't set up like the uh, uh, the the Mars occultation there in December, lunar mm-hmm. eclipses, because um, I can just grab the whole thing. In fact, um, I think I'm going to upgrade my FS60. I think I'm going to uh, buy a new tube ring, and I'm going to actually make it a little lighter even just just to really tweak out that performance. But I think these AT60 ED scopes are, you know, from what I saw, like you had the, uh, the William Optics 61 uh, ED, Shane, and I, I think on every target except for Mars, I think that they're basically the same as, as the TAC or they're pretty, pretty close anyway. Yeah. Well, the, the William optics uses FPL 53 glass, which is, uh, like a synthetic fluorite essentially. So it, uh, it should match TAC performance pretty close, but, um, the, uh, all, all of these little scopes are getting so good now, you know, like the quality yeah. is just really quite amazing actually. Yeah, like if you look at the, you know, and and just I remember just after I bought my because I have a FPL fifty three in my um, Borg one two five SD, which is the five inch, and then um, Skywatcher started making the hundred and twenty EDs after that, mm-hmm. and I remember looking through a bunch of them, and like you can boy you can see the difference, but wow, is it's very very slim on a telescope that costs you know, I think less than half, or maybe it's like, you know, 40% as, as much as my scope, uh, you know, you're, you're really only getting like about a 10% bump. And I, I it's about the same with, uh, with the tack, but it's kind of like the ultimate, um, 60 millimeter scope. But I think the main downside, the only real downside with the, uh, tack FS 60, I don't know why I'm talking about this so much. I guess I've been thinking about it lately, but that's a whole different story is that, um, I don't want to, get it damaged or lose it. And I was traveling recently and I didn't take it because there was a, a high chance of luggage loss. And so I didn't, um, I didn't want to want to put any of the parts in my, in my luggage because I thought for sure, uh, well, I didn't think for sure. I, we, we were fairly certain we were going to lose a bag. Uh, we didn't, but tons and tons of people were losing luggage over the holidays. So I just, I just didn't take it. It was fine, but I would have preferred to take a telescope with me. Um, that's kind of how, how I like to roll. So anyway, this setup here on the desert sky, I like, I wish you wrote more about how that desert sky works. I'm going to, I'm going to keep reading here. I think that's a nice set. Teleview 32 loved mine until I crushed it in a vice. Um, see like our second episode. I, think we'll talk about that. I know I, you, you know, you hear of things that amateur astronomers do. That would be a neat episode. Like what is the stupidest thing you've done? Like everybody does a stupid thing. Like I crushed. A, a otherwise perfectly good Teleview Plossel 32 millimeter, which is not an inexpensive eyepiece. I crushed that in a vice. I admit it. I did that. And my friend who I did it in front of 
and and he didn't laugh or anything. My friend Tim, he didn't laugh. He was really sympathetic. And I, I think like we're both in pretty big shock. Yeah. And I'm it's not like I just sort of bent it a little. I mean, no, no, like the glass actually made that terrible crunching sound, like you know, the kid from a Christmas story when he steps on his glasses in the backyard after firing. Anyway, uh, it's just like the the worst thing, right? But he told me after that, he told me his um his his terrible faux pas, which was he had um like some discoloration on an eight inch Smith green, which was his first telescope. And he decided to take um something almost abrasive to the lens to try to get it off. And he was scrubbing and stuff was coming off. He's like, oh, this is great. I'm getting it off. I'm getting it off. And it turned out he took the coating off the lens of the Schmickassa green. <laughs> Yikes. All right. I'll well, and, and I dropped my TAC 76 off the mount. Uh, That's right. I talked about it, <clears throat> excuse me, about a year or so ago, just mounting it stupidly. So you're right. We all do it. Yeah. All right. He goes on to say, uh, I get a lot of use out of this setup and I never want for other eyepieces than what I have on board. This made me look critically at the eyepieces ahead for my other refractors. And I decided to go with a three or four um, eyepiece uh, set up for each of those in total. I also have grown tired of super heavy eye pieces because of balance. So I sold my Nagler 31, 5, and 3.5, as well as my Ethos 10. I still have the Nagler 17 millimeter on the classifieds waiting to be sold. The money for those sales funded the Astrotech 102 EDL and the Batter 1.25 inch Zeiss Prism click lock diagonal. This, this this guy, Chris, he's more after you now than me, Shane. My mm-hmm. three refractors are the 152, 102, 72. We'll now share the Panoptic 24, Nagler 13, Nagler 7, and the Nagler 3-5 Planetary Zoom. Super simple. That is super nice. I also dust off my pencils from my first uh, sketch. I dust off my pencils and did my first sketch. That's a crazy. Did you see this? This is his first lunar sketch he did uh, using a uh, moon map site. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he had the moon map site on a screen and then just to get used, I think, to the pencils and everything, yeah. sketch that. But yeah, it's incredible. He's Yeah. That's, that's an, I, yeah, you got to get out of the eyepiece, Chris. Uh, I haven't been out observing since November work uh, was tired me out. We adopted a one-year-old dog and it's been a week of single digit temperatures uh, and very windy here lately, which I'm sure you experienced worse there. We have, but there was somebody, somebody wrote us from like Texas or no, it was, oh man, the, his name escapes me, but he was writing from New Jersey and it was, I remember it was minus 12 in New Jersey and it was warm. It was warmer here than in New Jersey. <laughs> well, our temperatures have been great lately, yeah. Chris, you know, it, yeah. you know, truth be told, it's been wonderful the last two or three weeks, but it's just been cloudy and lots of humidity. Yeah. Anyway, um, so goes on to say, I'm looking forward to getting out, uh, once or twice a week. Uh, the first light to get first light on my 102 millimeter. Take care of Chris in Long Island. So yeah, thanks so much for that, Chris. Yeah, th- I think this this one's going to speak a little bit more to you, Shane. I think than uh, because you're you're uh, somebody I think that is more saddled along to the one and a quarter inch eye pieces than I have. Yeah, yeah, particularly with my smaller telescopes. Um, I just don't like using two inch accessories with my like 70 millimeters and 50 millimeter telescopes. And even when I had the William optic 61, uh, which I've sold, um, you know, I did use some of my two inch stuff in there, but I just, I don't like it because of how much weight it adds to the end, Mm -hmm. you know, a two inch diagonal, no matter which one you use substantially heavier than a inch and a quarter, particularly a prism. Um, and then of course the eyepieces, especially if you're, uh, using plossels, they're so light compared to anything two inch. Um, anyway, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm very similar. I have a lot, I still have all of my two inch glass, but I barely use it. And I kind of question why I have it. Um, I, my place, man, don't worry about it. I, <laughs> okay. You'll store it for me. I'll Thanks. Um, but yeah, I could totally relate to Chris. I'm, uh, I'm very similar in my approach now. Uh, once in a while, I do really, really enjoy those wide fields, uh, particularly under uh, darker skies, um, which is why I'm still hanging on to some of that two inch stuff. But um, yeah, I, I love this approach. Um, there's uh, like my my simplest setup is um, a 24 millimeter panoptic for the wide field. 
Um, then I have the uh, Nikon MC2 zoom, which is a uh, 21 to 21 millimeter to nine millimeter focal range. And then the, uh, the Nagler zoom, the three to six millimeter kind of covers the whole spectrum and you have three eyepieces and they're all quite lightweight. Um, but, uh, I, I really like his refractor lineup too, a 152, a 102 and a 72. That's nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm really like where my next move will probably be telescope wise is likely a 152. Um, I've been kind of desiring one for quite a while and there's one for sale on astral buy sell right now, which is uh, a pretty good buy. I think. Yeah. Uh, I, and I've I been mulling it over. Go. Sorry. Sure, because I, I found like with my, cause I've compared my, uh, tack hundred to my, uh, board, 125 sd which has pentax glass which i won't sell because it's really good but um but boy the difference is again it's it's much more subtle than than you think that mm -hmm. uh, telescope that's 25 percent larger is uh is going to be like i notice a pretty big jump going from like an 80 to 100 i feel like that seems like a huge jump yep and going from the 100 to 125 it's subtle Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and that's why I sold my 120 Skywatcher ED. Like once I purchased that uh, TSA 102, I felt that they were a lot closer than they were different in terms yeah. of the views. And, and um, uh, you know, the, the 120 was still a beautiful telescope, but I didn't foresee me using it as much, particularly because with the TSA 102, I can use my bino viewer natively. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Skywatcher, I would have had to physically cut the tube to shorten it in order for me to use my bino viewer natively. Yeah. So, you know, those factors all together led me to sell it. But um, uh, like the, the TS Optic uh, 152 refractors, um, in fact, I think a lot of their doublets have a removable tube, just like, right. I think it screws into the focuser, but yeah. you remove this tube. And I think there are typically 120 millimeters. You remove that and then it's bino friendly. Like you can use your bino viewer natively and, and that's part of the overall design. So I'm really intrigued by those 152 doublets because of that aspect. You know, it, it, it's a bino viewing scope or you can kind of convert it real quickly back to, uh, mono viewing. So, um, you know, keep, stay tuned that that's probably something in my future. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Like, I'd love to look through that. That would for sure be great. Uh, Larry sent us an email. Do you want to take it away with Larry? Yeah. Yeah. So Larry emails us, uh, quite regularly. Uh, Larry, uh, is from Japan and, uh, he says, dear Chris and Shane, uh, Merry Christmas. Hope you are both, uh, enjoying your Christmas holiday. Really enjoyed the 12 eye pieces of Christmas episode. A lot of fun to listen to. Uh, I was very happy to hear that many of the eye pieces that I use made it on to the lists. So I thought I would share my own 12 eye pieces, uh, for Shane, there is a, there is an almost complete set of TAC MC orthos, uh, from the 25 millimeter on down to the seven, uh, don't have the five millimeter and don't really want to jam my eye in that tight, uh, with the four millimeter, uh, and the 2.8 millimeter high orthos as well. Uh, I think the set came out to be about $450 in total. So well under the $100 limit. Uh, these seven are my primary double star and planetary eyepieces. Uh, for Chris, the Pentax XW 10 millimeter and seven millimeter for more wide field and medium power work, uh, about 60 and 80 power in my 80 millimeter F7. Uh, these two are for clusters and bright nebula. So that makes nine. Uh, the two Barlows I keep in my kit are the Nikon 1.6 and the Takahashi two times Barlow. The TAC Barlow is not that well known, but combined with the TAC 1.25 inch prism and TAC MC orthos, it's wonderful, uh, clear and sharp. Uh, to round out the 12, I have a Japanese made 20 millimeter, 70 degree eyepiece. Uh, and I'm not even sure how to translate the company's name. And I don't think they sell their eyepieces and binos outside of Japan. It is very light and sharp to the edge. A nice eyepiece. Uh, hope you both get some observing in over the holidays. Clear skies. And, yeah. uh, I can certainly, you know, people have heard me wax on many times about the TAC MC orthos. I, <laughs> I think they're wonderful eyepieces. Um, you know, and just back to Chris's email actually about like a lightweight setup, 
you really can't beat using 0.965 inch eyepieces if you really want the ultimate lightweight setup. Um, and the nice thing, you know, I guess, again, if you're not super concerned about wide fields is if you're using an orthoscopic eyepiece, uh, a 0.965 inch or a one and a quarter inch barrel will not change the field of view. You're still getting about that 40 degree field of view that orthos always provide. You're just, if you're using the 965 inch, you're just getting a much lighter, much smaller eyepiece, which, uh, has a lot of benefit. Yeah. We had some, I had some recent correspondence. Larry is an enabler an enabler <laughs> <laughs> anyway we're gonna i think we'll do maybe a whole episode on correspondence and then at one point we'll have to um yeah that that's a great email yes you know sort of our apologies in a way i guess maybe we should have mentioned that uh yeah we have uh we're we're a little bit behind in getting to the Christmas emails. Yeah, we're st- I'm, I'm still getting over this call. I don't know if people can tell or not, but my voice still isn't all there. But uh, yeah, we kind of I think had intended maybe to to record this earlier, but uh, it's all it's all good. But uh, yeah, looking forward to maybe getting a piece of gear that uh, that Larry recommended. I'll move on and and uh, read Mark's email. I think this is our last email. Sounds good. Hi, Chris and Shane. I've Just greatly enjoyed the 12 eyepieces of Christmas episode, a classic in my view. I want to drop you a quick note to say thanks for another year of inspiration, entertainment, information. You know, I have to say something that's, you know, sort of out of, I guess, out of this email about um, probably the, the episodes that people seem to enjoy the most are the ones that usually we come up with at the last minute. Because I had some other ideas for what we would do. And then this one, we just kind of cobbled together out of a few ideas for a bunch of different shows Mm -hmm. that we agreed not to do. (laughs) Made this, this one on the 12 eye pieces of Christmas instead, and people really enjoyed it. So it's kind of funny sometimes, you know, you know, it's like you you stay up late the night before the papers do, and then you get a good mark, you know, kind (laughs) of. Yeah, I liked that episode. It was fun. You know, it was one where we really just bantered back and forth and yeah. uh, it was a pretty open script, which was nice. A pretty open script. I think uh, usually our show notes can be many pages long. That was like a one page. <laughs> anyway, good stuff. Thank you. Um, my own plans for 2023 observing include a planned purchase of the new AZ GTI X, which will allow me to mount an ST80 next to my Mac one two seven enjoy wide field and high field high mag views um aligned together there may be a small plan in there to upgrade the st80 to an ed instrument in there most probably uh, uh skywatcher evo star 72 ed shane i see you i see you high is it did i read that wrong az gti x uh i just highlighted it to copy and paste it because this is a new mount i'm not super familiar with so i wanted to see what the specs were yeah, you do this because i'm not that familiar with it I, either so take take a look i'll finish reading the email and then we'll chat about it looking forward to uh getting back on the deep sky track after distinctly uh distinctly planetary themes summer and fall wishing you and yours a merry christmas peaceful new year hopefully along with some clear skies for you guys to get reasonable temperatures and as always, keep up the great work. It's appreciated. Kind regards, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Really appreciate the uh, Christmas wishes from from everybody, both from the folks um, who you read and and many folks who who wish us uh, happy holidays and happy New Year's. Um, who we just simply couldn't read every every email we received. It's uh, it's a lot of fun, actually. Just where you're looking at that chain, I'll just sort of riff for a second. But um, over the holidays, you know, I was with my family, and you know. I I don't know if they recall that do a podcast or not, but I was just sitting there and I was getting different emails from people from all over the world. And I'm like, Oh, I just got a, you know, somebody sent me a photo that they had taken the night before. Um, and I'm, boy, I can't remember the individual's name, but it was from the outback in Australia somewhere. And so I was sitting there, I'm like, yo, hey, mom, look at this. Someone just sent me this photo from the outback of Australia. They took last night or, or whenever it was. And she was like, what? <laughs> you, know, <I'm> like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then we're like exchanging emails and there was other people who wrote and I was kind of like sort of reading, reading them out to my family during the holidays. It was pretty, pretty cool to sit there and read. And my wife always loves to hear them. I often um, sit downstairs and she'll be working at night and I'll just sort of read uh, people's people's emails aloud. It's uh, it's really nice. Uh, and, you know, 
people often talk about how uh, everybody in the internet can be so so negative all the time and uh you know that that hasn't been our experience at least so far thankfully yeah yeah exactly i love it all right tell me so, about now. yeah the, the skywatcher az gti x appears to be just a little bit more robust or a beefier mount than the gti that uh was the original one so this one has two saddles on it so it's you know out of the box it can accommodate two telescopes um otherwise like kind of the design and form factor look pretty similar chris uh, the payload, if you're just running one telescope, it says six kilograms. Uh, if you're running two telescopes, uh, 10 kilograms of total payload. Wow. Um, nice. so a little bit, I think that's a little higher than the GTI and then having the, the second saddle there is kind of nice. So interesting. Okay. I don't know what, I don't know what the cost is, but, um, I don't know. I'm just on the Skywatcher page. It looks like they fixed a couple, like a couple of things that I would have recommend it to fix though i'm trying to see if uh anyway so a couple things i see right off the hop is one they uh put like an extension on and definitely it needs a, a different it needed a different extension than what came with it and uh, that looks like a like a really nice extension that they've got on there and then they've also mounted it i think on the I think it's actually mounted to the to the tripod that I bought aftermarket. So I bought a steel tripod aftermarket, and it looks like they just put it on that uh, to begin with. So it has a smaller or shorter pier that's thicker, and it looks like it's it looks like it's got a better connector to uh, to that pier extension. It looks like they fixed that. And then oh yeah, here I got a better picture. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's my tripod. Or it's or it's a heavier duty tripod anyway. The one that came with it is it was too light in my opinion. Good for astro photos, maybe with a camera. And um, yeah, it looks like they've just beefed it up. I would like that. I would get that if I was buying it again. Maybe uh, maybe Skywatcher will give me one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm just looking. Wow, somebody put a big piece of gear on this. Looks like they put. Holy smokes. I got to look this up now. Now we're going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. I see somebody on cloudy nights has an Astro tech one Oh two ED with a, maybe a 70 on it as well. What is that? This yeah, 70 ED. Wow. This person over on stargazers lounge, Shane, they put, they put a uh, Skywatcher star travel one twenty millimeter F five on the other side. Holy smokes. It looks like they put an eight inch SCT from Celestron. Oh yeah. I see somebody asking about that here. Wow. That seems like an awful lot to put on that little mount, but that but might, maybe, maybe it'll work. That might be heavy. And they're right. that they, they're testing out the payload capacity, 9.99 kgs, but, um, that's pretty good. <laughs> I wonder how much this thing costs. I'm not seeing a price on it. We got to get a price here. Maybe is it available in North America? Must well, be. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not seeing it for sale, but like people have it. So I don't know. Don't it's, know where you get it. I see it on APM. I don't know. We'll have to get back to that. We're getting out of time here. All right. Oh, here we go. 479 euros, I believe. Or is that the pound? sign so 500 euros is going to be let's eh, give or take five times 800 three canadian is, yeah. oh, this, that, that was pounds that was british pounds my bad yeah so that's going to be like seven so you're 800 canadian probably shipped and then you're going to pay taxes and duties so this is like a thousand dollar amount for us yeah yeah 783 canadian is what that comes to okay not bad i think i think it's worth it i think like for for slightly more carrying capacity and beefier tripod, better pure. Yeah, I would pay it. Like I'm mm. hoping they put a little bit more quality control. I'm hoping they've just fixed that the interior because the interior was my main complaint, but it looks like they've fixed a lot of little little things with it. We should end this soon. Yeah, we should probably wrap add? this. What's that? Do you have anything else to add to this episode? No, I don't. <laughs> All right. And if you, the listener, have enjoyed this, we would appreciate if you could do us a favor and leave us a five-star rating on your podcatching software or system or whatever you're using and say something fun and positive about the show. And it'll, it'll help others find 
actual astronomy in 2023. We're always happy to get your observing reports and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, everybody. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com. <laughs>